I'm Patrice Kelch, and um, I'm going to be offering uh, the practice tonight because Shelly is leading the Labor Day retreat <clears throat> with Mark. So I'm glad you're all all here and um, happy to see you. As usual, these sessions are um, being recorded, but all of all the visuals are edited out except for better or for worse my visual so you don't have to worry that somehow in this um recording that your your image is going to show up it will just be just be me so great to have you here um and i'm going to continue as um as Shelley's been working through the uh, Tanasara and Kitaro, uh, Kitisaro book, I will be talking about chapter four too. So let's begin with a, a meditation. And um, I'm going to uh, use a bell and I hope that you will see that just as um, an invitation to um, invitation to be in the moment rather than a sort of signal to uh, to start some technique. We're just going to have a, a meditation tonight in which we really practice um, receptivity and and ease. So find whatever is. Um, an appropriate meditation posture for you. It might be sitting on a chair or a bench or um, on a mat, and it could be lying down. So whatever is going to be most supportive for you tonight, choose that, that posture as we explore ease and freedom in our practice. So just let yourself sit, or if you're lying down, lie down, without doing anything. Just letting the body settle. And gently appreciate this moment. Letting yourself feel truly welcomed on this earth. You belong here on the home planet. And just allow that sense of welcome and belonging to support you.
relaxed and at ease. At home right here. And just allow yourself to relax into the support that we give to and get from each other just by being here. And every part of you is entirely welcomed here. Nothing needs to be left out. And see if you can let your attention just rest with the breath without any striving or forcing. Just allowing the attention just to rest on the breath. as effortless as just putting one hand on top of another. Just relaxing into breathing in and breathing out. Just giving the mind as much time and space as it takes for the mind to naturally settle. No hurry. No real goal. Just allowing the mind to do what it will do when it's relaxed.
in the text, Kit of Sorrows suggests that you can use the mantra Budo as a support for letting the mind settle. And Bu on the in-breath, Do on the out-breath. Sometimes that that supports a kind of calmness. You could also softly note, <coughs> note to yourself, allowing on the in-breath and letting go on the out-breath not having to do anything, but just aware of how it is. We allow on the in-breath, we accept, and we let go on the out-breath. And accepting and letting go, which is the nature of the breath, the nature of breathing. It's as if we just let ourselves move out of the way of letting the mind and the body find a kind of equipoise. Just relaxing into this kind of awareness. and attending to this very receptive nature.
just abiding in the here and now with an awareness that knows both mind and the activity of mind. And for the last five minutes of our practice tonight, I encourage you to turn your attention toward gratitude. And see if you can cultivate a felt sense of gratitude. And let your attention be with the experience as much as with the contents. See if you can have an embodied experience of gratitude.
So welcome, um, I'm Patrice Kelch, um, longtime member of Common Ground from the very beginning and um, someone who teaches at Common Ground. And um, if you're at all inclined, it would be great if you would um, turn on your video so we can see each other and say hello to each other. Nice to see you all here this evening. Okay. So I um, am so glad that Shelley has been doing this book. I've really been enjoying it. And I'd read it first about two years ago and um, have not had had not had the opportunity to practice with um, Tanisara or Kitisaro. And then two weeks ago, um, someone sent me um, a note and said, oh, you like um, Kuan Yin so much. Um, Tanisara and Kitisara are going to be doing a Kuan Yin ceremony virtually. Um, and this was a, a week ago on Sunday. So I signed up and it was um, they were doing a practice that was, uh, it's a, a Chinese practice. It's very devotional, lots of chanting, lots of bowing. And that's not um, sort of my primary added, uh, sort of venue for practice, but it was lovely to practice with both of them and to see their uh, great um, enthusiasm, their great devotion, their great commitment. And what made it really poignant was that um, they said the fires were 10 miles from them and they were two miles out of the evacuation zone. 
So they were packed and ready to leave if they had to. You know, and they were practicing because as we all are, <clears throat> you know, practicing from our own homes, you know, they had this beautiful little altar and um, just this, this very lovely kind of sacred domestic space and um, this idea that, that they might they might have to leave. And um, I do have a, a Dharma friend in California actually who has lost her home to the fires. Um, she, um, she said the police knocked on the door at three o'clock in the morning and said, you know, you've got to go. And um, they, um, they didn't know for a couple of days whether they lost their home or not, but they did. So uh, it was really poignant to practice with um, Kitasaro and Tanisara at this moment when um, they didn't know whether they were going to have to have to leave or or not, and to see their sort of steadfastness in in practice and um, was well, just really quite a um, a beautiful thing. So I thought what I'd like to talk about with you tonight is the part of chapter four um, where Tanisaro talks about, where I'm sorry, where, where Kitasaro talks about his illness. And for those of you who don't have the book, if you want to find um, where it is on um, common, uh, common ground, um, it's um, in the blog. But I will, um, I'm going to read this section to you. It's quite striking. So Kitasara writes, one of the great trials of my monastic life was almost dying of typhoid fever in Thailand, which led to years of sickness. I was completely changed by this. My body had been very athletic and I had a lot of energy and positive willpower. But due to my illness, I lost a lot of weight and all my energy. I spent three years in bed and then for years afterwards, I struggled with low energy and debilitating exhaustion. I kept thinking, I'm a meditator. I should be able to heal myself, but I couldn't. Illness wasn't a teacher I would have chosen, but there was nothing I could do about it. Until that point, I had basically been able to accomplish whatever I wanted through willpower, study, and persistence. I'd been able to bend circumstances to my desires. My sense of self was intimately connected with my success. Then I spent years st struggling with chronic pain, overpowering weakness, and digestive disorders. The Buddha said that sickness, old age, and death are heavenly messengers. They wake us up. Certainly they became very real to me. There was no way I could live in denial of these truths. Though I saw doctors and healers and underwent myriad treatments, I couldn't overcome the illness. Unable to participate in the normal monastic routine, I felt like a failure. However, one day my abbot, Ajahn Sumedho, came to my bed and said, Kitasaro, I want to apologize to you. I wanted you to get well all this time, remembering how strong you used to be, but I realized that's putting a strain on you. Then he said, Kitasaro, I give you my permission to die. I felt so much relief at his statement that I cried with joy. I felt I was given permission to deeply accept my situation. Before that, there had always been this resistance to sickness, that it was wrong and a personal failure. Also, though it was with good intentions, the pressure from friends, family, 
healers, and myself to get well had become a burden. After Ajahn Sumedho said that and released me, although I still took my medicine and saw doctors, I became more accepting of the reality of my condition. I stopped believing that I had to get well. I began to deeply receive my situation. As I lay on my bed, I would spend hours being with the sensations in my body. I would hold the body in awareness. And just as I've explained, I would take attention with the breath right to the places where there was pain and just stay there with great patience and gentleness. This is how I got a real feeling for the power of samadhi, not only as that which focuses the mind, but also that which heals. And I think one of the things that speaks to me uh, so strongly in this uh, passage is, although it's specifically about sickness, uh, I think it is more generally about the sort of expectations that we often have about ourselves as meditators. You know, how our meditation should be. Um, over the past <coughs> couple of years, it seems to me more and more that the teachers I, I work with, um, you know, say, don't, don't go looking for a, a technique. You know, when you, when you sit down to practice, you know, do you immediately jump into, um, this is what I'm, I'm going to do, you know, to have this, this very, um, kind of stringent expectation of what our practice should look like, how our our practice should be, what we should be as as meditators. I mean for a number of years I've uh, especially when I've been, you know, sitting in the teaching role, you know, I've sort of imagined myself wearing a t shirt that says Dharma fraud because you know, I have that idea that my somehow my practice isn't good enough. And this is such a, a, a wonderful uh, example of how, how much we suffer when we have expectations about our, our practice. You know, most of us do come to a, a practice, I think, feeling that there's something, something wrong that we're suffering that we we come to practice because of, of suffering. And, um, you know, the Buddha said, um, I teach one thing and one thing only, suffering and the end of suffering. And some people say, well, that's two things. But it's, he would only teach suffering if he could also teach the end of suffering. And that in understanding suffering, we understand the end of suffering. Um, and, you know, the, the Buddha likened himself to uh, a doctor in in many of the uh, suttas. He gives examples of a doctor or a surgeon. You know, he um, describes the illness, he identifies the cause, um, has a, a prognosis about about the cause, and then a, a treatment to um, to work with the illness, to um, to achieve a a good outcome. And, you know, the, the word that we use for, um, dukkha, the word for suffering, which gets translated in, you know, dis-ease, um, striving, suffering is the most generic. But I've always thought it's been helpful, um, to recognize that the sort of etymologically, um, the word for suffering comes from a root which means that sort of, um, the hub of the wheel is out of alignment with the axle. And so this idea about out of alignment, that we suffer when things are out of alignment with how things are. Another really useful translation of suffering is that which is hard to bear. 
I mean, and you can think of this as literally what is difficult to bear. Um, and, and what is it that, that is difficult for us to, um, to bear? And it, it's usually that we have some sort of uh, fixed idea about how things are. Like in here, Kitasaro talks about this idea that, you know, he should get well. And that, uh, and, and how much his identity was caught up in, you know, I'm a monk, I should be able to participate in monastic life. Um, the mention that he was feeling that he was a disappointment to his family because he didn't get well. That this, the, we suffer so often because we are attached to a view that is out of alignment with reality, out of alignment with the way things are. And when we can see how things are, um, see with some clarity, um, you know, I, I want to say something else again, you know, the, the phrase how things are, the more accurate way of understanding that is how things have come to be, which really reminds us that things just don't happen spontaneously, accidentally, that things are the way they are because of causes and conditions. So our present circumstances are things as they have come to be. And seeing that clearly, that's what really enables us to engage in skillful action. That's what really enables us to see how we can respond in compassionate and, and useful kind of, of ways. Um, and, you know, in, uh, in this chapter particularly, and, and the one before, there's you no know, discussion about samadhi as the practice of, uh, of presence. You know, it's this kind of collectedness of, of mind. And when I was a, a teenager, I spent a lot of time um, with horses. I never had, I was not a, came from a very lower middle class family. So I did not have a horse of my own, but I did ride other people's horses. And there's this expression that we used to have that was called collect your horse. Before you did anything, you collected your horse. And that meant that you were completely present to how the horse felt, that you were in contact with, with the bit, that your weight was there, that you were, were completely one with the horse. And it has just been such a, a useful image for me in thinking about the mind. I think about collecting the mind, about uh, really being attentive in this way, uh, and that then uh, you know, sort of uh, it's um, as you're attentive to to the horse, and you, know, you can think about your own body too, collect, collect yourself, attentive to it, and then being able to act in a really present and um, and unified way, this sort of steadiness. Um, and that, that really has in it an inherent sort of um, equanimity. So I'm going to read something else from the text because I, I know not everyone else has gotten to, to read this about the composed mind, the collected mind. When the mind is composed, it sees clearly. With samadhi, we enter a realistic relationship with elements of our world, the body and mind, its moods, feeling, thoughts, and intentions. We can let conditions be as they are, and in doing so, notice the larger context of awareness itself. Even though this contemplative process is a gradual training, it's good to remember that freedom is always here and now, right in the midst of any moment, whatever the condition, the essential nature of everything, including the mind, is freedom. That's always a huge, huge idea to me. And sometimes it seems 
really clear and frankly, other times, not so much. It's sort of an aspiration of mine to really be able to understand that in any moment, there is a kind of freedom in, in seeing clearly. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I really get that. And then sometimes it seems more elusive. But it's my aspiration to, to really get that. And I, I just finished reading um, a book that's come out very, very recently called um, The Buddhist on Death Row. I don't know if any of you have heard of that or you know about the, the case of Jay Jarvis Masters, who has spent 30 years in San Quentin um, on death row and is uh, a student of Pema Chodron. She visits him frequently and... Um, uh, apparently, he um, you know, calls her all the time, and she's told everyone at the monastery that when she says she can't be interrupted for, for anything, the one exception is if, um, if Jarvis J. Masters uh, calls. And he's had this remarkable life um, uh, at San Quentin and uh, had a you know, kind of tragic upbringing and was convicted of participating in the murder of uh, a correctional officer at the facility that um, he maintains he was not involved in. And he's had many, many appeals, and they've all been turned down. And he's spent, you know, um, he's been practicing almost the whole time he was there. He had a, a Buddhist attorney came to work with him, and uh, that was sort of the beginning. And then she introduced him to um, uh, a Tibetan Rinpoche who came and met with him. And then eventually um, he came to be working with Pema Chodron, who has visited him frequently at San Quentin. And, um, and he has, has written, he's had a couple of books published, and he's had a really remarkable life of uh, really helping people who are in just um, a terrible place. And he's had just all these tremendous disappointments of um, all of his appeals um, being turned down. And he's finally, I think his last appeal is to a, a federal court. He's exhausted all his state appeals. And he really talks about finding freedom. I mean, it's just remarkable for him to... Uh, to realize that this is a place where he can be free and uh, and his mind is free and that he can really do good, that he can really live out this bodhicitta aspiration of living for the benefit of all others. And so it's just um, you know, a, a tremendously, uh, tremendously inspiring uh book. And I, for a number of years, up until the pandemic, I was regularly volunteering at a, um, a correctional facility. And often, uh, I shouldn't say often, not often, but sometimes men would say things like, you know, if I had a choice between being free but going back to the mind that I had before I came in here or staying here with the mind that I have now, I'd stay here with this mind rather than leave the facility getting my old mind back. So it really is a, a transformative practice. And a lot of it really comes back to our capacity to uh, see how things are and to be with, to really bear with what is, uh, is difficult. Um, and this, practice that that um, we talk about, you know, distinguishing between the mind and the activity of mind, this knowing awareness, this really grounds us as we face the really difficult to bear circumstances of our lives. So many people with the pandemic so many people find themselves in this 
very strange limbo with no horizon. You know, just in this, this, it sometimes feels like a bit of a, a time warp. Uh, and it's so hard to, uh, to live in this, this great uncertainty. Um, but when we can be with it, you know, really paying attention to the present moment, like the glorious day that we just had. I mean, it's just extraordinary day. Um, the first time I ever came to Minnesota was in, in a September when there was a day like this. And I just, um, I've been living in Ohio for a number of years and, and, uh, and I just couldn't believe how beautiful it was here, how big the sky was, how clean the air was, to see the clouds. I mean, it was just this glorious day like today. And to really appreciate a day like today, to really uh, have our, our awareness attuned to all the the wonderful sounds, like I can hear the sort of cicadas in the back and sort of buzzing and the crickets. And whenever I hear crickets, I think the Buddha also heard crickets. You know, I mean, that, that's just kind of that, that connection. Um, so if we can be in this um, pandemic without obsessing on what we miss, what we want, uh, you know, sort of hanging on to the past, clinging to the past, what isn't there, or um, falling forward into the future. I mean, so many people have said, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do when it's, <clears throat> when it's November and you know, a lot of just all this sort of anticipatory um, suffering. And um, the week before this one, um, my, my husband is a racket sports person. And um, the week before this one, someone dropped dead on the pickleball court. Someone who was young, someone who was in his 40s. And, you know, it's such, um, someone said something to me about, you know, November. And I said, well, you know, who knows if we get to November? And, you know, I'm not thinking particularly about COVID. I'm thinking about, you know, being hit by a car or I mean, the, the sort of uncertainty of our lives. Um, Kitasara mentions, you know, old age, sickness and death to really get that. Um, that's what um, that's what awaits us. And we don't know what the time scale is. You know, every morning I do this kind of the, the five reflections that you're probably familiar with from from Mark about, you know, um, you know, I'm the nature. Uh, I'm of the nature to, to grow old. And I say to myself, I am getting old. Illness and infirmity await me. My death approaches daily, and everything that I is dear to me will be separated from me. And then there's the reflection. You know, I am the inheritor of my past karma, uh, the owner of my present karma, and the fabricator of my future karma. You know, that's really that that kind of grounding in this is how things are. And it's really, um, really salutary. And I think about, you know, climate change, which is something else that is just so, um, so much uh, in front of us right now because of the fires and the storms. And again, realizing that, all these things have natural causes and in many cases causes in which we're all implicated because of our, our use of um, fossil fuels and the, the petrol. You know, we, we all in some ways are, are implicated in this, in this situation. And, um, and that the same is with the, the tremendous, you know, racial reckoning that's going on where the sort of veneer that's covered over white supremacy has been really been torn away. And it's, it's pretty obvious for all of us to see. 
So it's a real question for me, you know, can I find some freedom and some stability in the face of all this? And I mean, particularly around um, racial reckoning, there are just some days when I wake up and I feel so uh, heavy because of that. I just feel a real heaviness. And um, that's when I, I really need to uh, sort of remember my, you know, take a, a big view, remember uh, my, the, my intentions, my efforts, um, and, and how important it is to see things clearly, to see these very difficult things clearly, because that really gives us the best chance of responding skillfully. Now, if we don't, if we don't uh, see clearly, we are, are likely inadvertently to do, um, to cause a harm through our, our ignorance. And certainly many of us um, can reflect and see all our, our sort of unintentional harming that we've been um, we've been a, a party to so uh, it's a, a very a very difficult time that we're that we're living in uh, you know, all these sorts of things compounded and um, you know what we really have to do is to be as present as possible um, in these circumstances and see if we can find some some freedom in that. And, and it's not an abdication of our skillful action and our engagement in the world, but can we find a kind of inner freedom that enables us to be skillful and helpful, that we're not clinging to something, that we have a kind of freedom of non-clinging that actually enables us to really um, engage in the most skillful kinds of ways. About two weeks ago, uh, a wonderful Zen teacher named Yvonne Rand died. And I don't know if anyone here knows of her. She was one of the early people with um, Suzuki Roshi and... Um, was I think she was an abbot at one time of San Francisco Zen Center, but she was a teacher, a Zen teacher in the Bay Area. And in the late 90s or early aughts, she came to Minneapolis and she gave a Dharma talk. And um, she uh, was invited by Compassionate Ocean Dharma. And it was when they were still having their meetings in um in the basement of the Mount Curve Unitarian Church, for those of you who know that in, in Minneapolis. And she gave a talk that just had this tremendous influence um, on me. It's the only time I've ever heard her speak. But she told this story about um, she and her husband had a home in, I'm pretty sure it was in Marin County, and they lived up kind of, in the in the hills, and their home was on a, a curve in the road. And she said they had, uh, over the years, groomed this really beautiful tall hedge uh, alongside the road, so that um, it you know protected. Uh, it was kind of a visual protection for the house and gave them some privacy and. Um, they had, they were quite, uh, quite pleased with it. And she said one day they got, uh, a notice from the California Department of Transportation that the hedge violated, um, sight lines and they had to take it out. And she thought, this is ridiculous. There's never been an accident up here. No one has ever had any problem with this. Uh, this is, you know, an environmentally responsible, uh, natural way of um, 
giving us some privacy and you know that they worked on all this these years to grow this very beautiful hedge and um she said they're just wrong about this and she said she also thought she said and you know i know people my husband's an attorney we're going to take care of this and she said they uh appealed the the ruling and they had all these hearings and she she just kept thinking we know the right people you know and this is this is so stupid um we're going to you know it would be a travesty for us to take down this hedge and she said this went on for several years for three going on four years and she said finally they got the notice that there were no more appeals either they took the hedge down or the california department of transportation would take the hedge down and charge them for it and i remember her saying she said and that very morning when we were going to do it she said i didn't know how i'd feel she said i just was curious about how would i feel and she said to her own surprise she felt completely okay and she said she felt completely okay because she had done everything she could do and she said so she had no regrets about anything left undone and because she had no regrets about anything left undone she was really able to accept the way things are and she said she could take out the hedge she and her husband took out the hedge with you know, they had some other people helping them with great equanimity and i was just i, I mean it it was um that's a wonderful lesson i i've just never never forgotten it um for a couple of reasons and one is that if you care about something you do everything you can if there's if there's a cause you believe in you do everything you can so that you don't have regrets and that was that was part of the lesson for me that that sometimes when i've had regrets about things you know you think oh well maybe i should have done this or i could have done something else but this is really i think it keeps she said they've done everything they could do and then they just accepted and this is the way it was and um i think that that's you know sort of what um uh kitasaro was saying you know when he accepted his illness and when um ajahn sumedho said to him you know you have permission to die you don't have to get well you've done everything you could you've done everything you could to get well and you know it looks like it might not happen you have my permission to die and and kitasaro talked about what a relief that was so i think these are really good lessons for us in this time you know a lesson to do for the causes we care about whatever um whatever we can do and then bring some equanimity to whatever the result is um you know as we um as we face all these challenges um to really do what we can without attaching to the notion that this is going to be successful in our lifetime you know there may be even worse times than these things things may not get better for a long long time but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do the very best we can and that when we can be there with great presence with great equanimity when there are really really difficult um difficult uh hard to bear um situations so i'm going to close with a quote by joanna macy and then we've got time if people would like to chime in um joanna macy says 
when we open to the pain of the world, we discover our interconnectedness in the web of life. This is the gift of dark and dangerous times to find again our mutual belonging. I'll read it again. When we open to the pain of our world, we discover our interconnectedness in the web of life. This is the gift of dark and dangerous times to find again our mutual belonging. So I'd be happy to hear your observations, comments. Um, just unmute yourself and jump in. You know, and, and sometimes we may we may want to be real intentional um, with a a practice. At this, you may uh, really want to explore something in in particular. Um, but it's been really useful in in the my early training as a meditator. You know, it was connect and sustain, connect and sustain, connect and sustain, and um, you know, it was really um, Sayadayutejna, who uh, brought to the attention of so many of us uh, who are meditators that there was so much striving that we just weren't aware of. You know, that all we were paying attention to was, you know, how the breath felt, you know, being just super, super, super focused on, on the breath. And there was no awareness of the, um, you know, the undertow of, of striving. And so that's a really, uh, clearly that's something that's really important to, to be aware of. So when we have this uh, kind of, of mind of samadhi, of this collected mind, uh, you know, we're aware both of the body sensations and also of the knowing faculty and then what's being, what's being known. Um, and that includes all those sorts of uh, flavors of mind. That actually was true for me too. And when that teacher credit uh, of saying you know, how things are really what 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 is meant literally is how things have come to be. Just make this small adjustment that was really clarifying. So me too. Well, let's just sit together for a few minutes before we um, dedicate the merit. And again, really appreciating the support we give to and get from each other just by showing up.
So when we share the merit, we engage in this really beautiful act of imaginative generosity. If there's any benefit to our practice, any good that comes for it, if we could, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others, with our parents, our families, our teachers, our friends, all of our Dharma brothers and sisters. And we can think tonight of uh, people in California, people in the South, people who are really suffering from natural disasters, people in Beirut suffering from terrible human-made disasters. We can share the merit with those who, in the words of the Sermon of the Mount, hunger and thirst for justice. And for all those who work on behalf of making our planet a more sustained and and healing place. And then we can share it with those that we have difficulty with. Whose efforts seem contrary to our own. We can wish for them to have some peace. For them not to suffer so much. We wish for all beings to be awakened, for all beings to be free, for all beings to find freedom in this moment and live with ease and with peace. Thank you all for your sincere practice. Um, If anyone has the time or is at all inclined on Saturday afternoon, I'm going to be doing a four hour virtual retreat and I'm going to um, offer it around four um, reflections by the great um, uh, deep ecologist and um, Buddhist philosopher practitioner, Joanna Macy. So if you are inclined, you can sign up on the on the Common Ground website, but that will be the the focus. Um, So um, thanks to everybody for coming.